Well, good morning. We're so glad to see you here at Cornerstone. Let's stand and worship and lift our voice.
storm across the work was finished God you poured out your life just to give us new
What a blessed mystery His punishment, my peace His punishment, my peace Oh, His punishment, my peace And may sacrifice that as we were dead in our sins but because of what you did on the cross we have been made alive and Lord may our lives reflect that so Lord move in our hearts that today if there's any barriers or, or blocks Lord, that they would be torn away and we would hear your word and that we would be drawn to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It is in your son's holy name that we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. What a joy it is to proclaim that he is risen together and to lift our voices 
We're so glad that you were here to worship with us. Won't you turn, find three or four people, tell them you're glad that they're here at Cornerstone this morning. All right, good morning, good morning, everyone. So good to see you out in the house of the Lord. Welcome to our online viewers as well. Um, I need to get through a few quick announcements and uh, I wanna try to save as much time as possible for the teaching this morning, but uh, a little encouragement to begin the announcement time. Uh, you remember last week I shared with you the frank conversation that I had with Governor Yunkin. I read a letter that he wrote to our congregation and uh, I, I expressed my, um, discouragement over the fact that he signed that HB 174 that kind of put into the code about same-sex marriage. Anyway, I shared that with you last Sunday. The next night, Monday night, uh, this past Monday, I was at a dinner with the uh, Family Foundation of Virginia. Sitting at, at the table with me was our Lieutenant Governor, Winsome Sears. I leaned over to her and I said, um, Listen, I'm about to ask you a question, and if this puts you in a predicament where you would rather not answer it, just say, I'd rather not answer it. I asked her, would you, if you were governor, would you have signed HB 174? Without hesitation, she said, absolutely not. And, and she said, in fact, when a bill is passed by the General Assembly, it comes to my desk first for my signature before the governor. And I wrote across my signature line, I cannot sign this bill. It's a direct violation of my moral standards in Christ. So praise God, a little encouragement. Listen, a little encouragement there. And uh, you know, the governor of Virginia is only a four year one term. So just remember Winsome Sears, ladies and gentlemen. All right, um, <clears throat> quick announcements. Tomorrow night, you who are young adults, you're in that age category 18 to 29. You have a resurrection party at the park. That's tomorrow night, seven o'clock. Your regular Monday night, same time, but you're gonna be at the park instead of at the ministry building. Uh, it is $15, because they're gonna have uh, food trucks, a fire pit going. They're gonna be showing Jesus Revolution. So that's tomorrow night for you young adults, 18 to 29, come on out to church. The park is that area up there with a the volleyball net. And then uh, coming up for you singles, you're 30 plus, you have an event Friday, April the 5th, seven o'clock, it's free, just uh, visit the events page, uh, but you all are gonna be having a, a time of fellowship and worship in the ministry building, that's April the 5th, seven o'clock. Uh, we've been mentioning also, third announcement, new service schedule times, trying to spread out the traffic a little bit, so you 8.30 people are gonna learn to come at 8.15, starting April 7th, the Sunday after Easter, 10 o'clock stays the same. The last service we bumped out a little bit uh, also at 12 noon. So that's all on our um, homepage at cornerstonechapel.net. And then finally, just a reminder about all our Easter services coming up this weekend, nine in total, five on Sunday all the time, uh, rather five on Saturday, all the times are listed there, four on Sunday. Again, you can go to our website. Now, we've been mentioning this, but just to kind of relieve the overcrowding, if you wanna go first to the ministry building, be, they're going to have live worship and then they'll stream in my teaching from here in the sanctuary. The added benefit of going to the ministry building first is you're going to get some free brunch. So uh, you might want to check that out and go to the, that's only for the four Sunday services. For Saturday, you got to be in here. And we'll have overflow in, in the rest of the building. But, but please, if you want to be able to get in the sanctuary, come early enough, every service, hour in length, every service will uh, be identical. And it's a great time for you to invite your, your, your family members and friends who don't know Christ. Um, we share about the good news of Jesus rising from the dead. I give an invitation for people to get saved. And speaking of invitations, we have these available for you at any of the welcome centers. You can pick up free glossy invitations with envelopes to hand to your friends, invite them to one of our Easter services. We'd love to, to have them here as well to hear the gospel. And we still need some volunteers. So if you all wanna scan that QR code, it'll take you to a volunteer page. 
Uh, you have different service times you can choose from to serve and then be with us uh, to worship for one of those services. So a lot going on this weekend, this Easter weekend. It's not just Easter Sunday around here at Cornerstone. This is Easter weekend coming up, and we're excited to come together, celebrate our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you happy about coming to church on Easter weekend? Now, uh, because of the nine services on Easter weekend, uh, my mama didn't raise no dummy. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to pass on Palm Sunday. And uh, I'm going to get uh, a friend to come and share with you um, so I can, you know, Easter is like the Super Bowl uh, for me. And so I need other people to help with the playoff games. And today, <laughs> Uh, on Palm Sunday, I have a, uh, it's a, he's a newfound friend, although I want to give you a little background about how I first met Dr. Mark Rutland. Uh, when I first um, started pastoring here at Cornerstone as a church plant in 1991 with 18 charter members, um, not only was I young, uh, you know, physically speaking, but had no clue what I was doing as a pastor. Still don't in many ways, still learning as I'm going. But um, it was important for me to learn and to study and to, you know, be mentored. And of course, you know, I'm a Calvary Chapel guy. So uh, Chuck Smith uh, has been my pastor up until his, his death in uh, about 10 years ago. And, um, and so Chuck Smith was, was really the greatest influence on me theologically, doctrinally, and philosophy of ministry as a church. But in 1993, um, two years after uh, the, the church plant here at Cornerstone, um, I went to a conference in Dallas, Texas, and uh, someone that I admired his preaching style was James Robison. And James Robison was hosting a conference, and I went. Um, just by myself, I went just to receive and learn as a young pastor of a, of a brand new church. And one of the speakers there was Dr. Mark Rutland. And um, so I've known of him and have studied him for the last 30 years. Uh, he, so Chuck, if Chuck was the greatest influence in my life, theologically, doctrinally, philosophy of ministry, Dr. Rutland has been the greatest influence in my life stylistically, that is how to communicate the gospel. And, and believe it or not, this morning was the first time we've met. Um, a mutual friend put us in contact, and I didn't even, this mutual friend said, have you ever heard of Dr. Mark Rutland? I said, I can't believe that you are mentioning his name because I've learned more from him in terms of how to preach than I think anyone else. And so it's my joy to have him here today. Uh, he has uh, some books out in the atrium uh, that um, I encourage you to, to check out. Uh, he'll be back there signing books. One, one is David the Great, Reconstructing the Man After God's Own, uh, Deconstructing the Man After God's Own Heart, uh, Courage to Be Healed, Finding Hope to Restore Your Soul. His latest one was, uh, is called Of Kings and Prophets. Uh, I was telling him earlier, I read one of his first books called The Finger of God. He said, that's not even in print anymore. So, um, but it was a wonderful book, as I'm sure these are as well. And he'll be in the atrium between services. But uh, Dr. Rutland is a New York Times bestselling author. He, he's uh, pastored uh, a mega church. So he's been a pastor. He's a bestselling author. He is the uh, executive director of the National Institute of Christian Leadership. He is the uh, founder of Global Servants. Global Servants uh, has ministries in Thailand and Ghana in particular. They have, uh, they have a ministry there to protect tribal girls from sex trafficking. And they, they have built since 1986 called the House of Grace that has rescued girls out of the sex trafficking. By the way, all the proceeds from the sales of his books goes to Global Servants to help with that ministry. He's also the past president of two Christian universities. So he is a man who is well-traveled and uh, just is so gifted of the Lord. And, and I'm happy to call him a new friend. And he's going to share God's word today on this Palm Sunday. Would you please welcome Dr. Mark Rutland. Good morning. 
<clears throat> Good morning. It's a joy to be here. What a wonderful and extravagant introduction. <laughs> I wish I had brought my wife. <laughs> She's not near as impressed with me as she should be. <laughs> well, I will look forward to meeting you at the book table. They've asked me if I would sign books. I'm delighted to. My signature in your book makes it defaced and therefore worthless. So uh, as he said, all the proceeds of those books, hundreds of thousands of books we've sold worldwide, they all go to support our girls' homes. So I hope you'll go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> Forget about Dave Ramsey. <laughs> Refinance your house. Take the children's lunch money. Come on. Well, you're a jolly crowd. I didn't know if the early group in any church, I preach in a different church just about every Sunday. The early service is usually not very jolly. <laughs> and you, you folks are caffeined up, so I'm proud of you. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the Palm Sunday passage, if you will, Luke chapter 19. I want to speak this morning on spontaneous grace. Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 29. And it came to pass when he, that is Jesus, of course, and it came to pass when he came nigh to Bethphage and to Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you in which at your entering you shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat, loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found it even as Jesus had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owner thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now... At the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Padre bendito celestial, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta mañana, porque te necesitamos mucho. Lord, we need you, we praise you, we worship you, we welcome you. We ask that you would brush aside every barrier to divine communication. That when we leave here today, we will say one to another, surely we have heard from the Lord. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. I'm a lifetime student of the discipline of communication. Your, your pastor and I talked about it. I, I've spent my life trying to understand what makes communication work. When it doesn't work, what happened? When it works, what made it work? Now I know what you're thinking. If he spent his life studying communication, seems like he'd be better at it. But you don't know how bad I might have been. <laughs> Here's what I've come to believe, that we're one to study the entire discipline of communication for a thousand years. The the creme de sens of communication is simply four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. If you get any of those four variables wrong, it can all go wrong, really wrong, really fast. You can think you're transmitting clearly and the message that's received is not at all what you intended. Every married man in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. I was preaching uh, not too long ago in California, which is evidently where the English language will be destroyed. And <laughs> I was preaching to a high school audience about the size of this. And I don't know when I've spoken to an audience that was so instantly with it. They were just with me the whole way. I, I don't know when I've ever spoken to a group like that. Afterward, I was speaking to four boys right down here. The first boy said, Dr. Rutland, you are one bad preacher. In my lifetime, <laughs> bad has come to mean good. 
The second boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you're the baddest preacher I've ever heard. <laughs> baddest is not even a word in the English language. <laughs> the third boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you are one sick dude. <laughs> one can only sense my level of personal affirmation. <laughs> the fourth boy, not content with these low altitude compliments, said, you are the OG of crunk. <laughs> I, I have no clue. <laughs> I teach the National Institute of Christian Leadership, to which your pastor made reference. Some years ago, a young man came through who now pastors a hip-hop church, whatever that is. So I called Tommy. I said, somebody just told me I was the OG of crunk. What does that mean? Oh, he said, OG means original gangster. I said, so he told me I'm the original gangster of crunk. He said, that's right. I said, Tommy, see, what I'm asking you is, what does it mean? <laughs> oh, he said, I assumed you knew what crunk means. I said, no, I don't. He said, it means you be the Mac Daddy. <laughs> I said, Tommy, what I'm after here lies along the, the range of a definition. He said, Dr. Mark, I'm trying. He said, it means you be off the chain. I just decided to leave it alone. Now, here's a remarkable moment of communication. Jesus says to two of his disciples, go over to the next village. In the first driveway, you'll see a brand new pickup truck with the sticker still on the window. Now I know you're saying to me, why do you say pickup truck? A donkey is a beast of burden and a means of conveyance. That's a pickup truck. And you say, yeah, but you made that up about the sticker still on the window. No, no, it says, on which never man sat. He says, take this screwdriver, go over there and hotwire that truck and bring it to me. And if anybody says, where are you going with my truck? Say, the Lord has need of it. <laughs> now, I've thought about that moment. Peter turns to John and says, you know, <laughs> what I, I'm a little nervous about this. So they climb in the truck. He takes a screwdriver and pops the cap off of the steering column. The truck roars. This guy charges off of the front porch. Maybe he's got a piece in his hand. And he says, where are you going with my truck? And he says, the Lord has need of it. And the guy says, take it and go. Now, I know there's somebody here who came to church this morning in a beautiful new pickup truck, and you think God is on your case. <laughs> That's not what this sermon is about. I'm using it as an example. It's a moment of such unfettered, spontaneous grace. Take it and go. However God gets that message to us, I give it. We think of the God of grace, but we're the people of the God of grace. We're supposed to be people of grace. Now, I, I don't know what your pastor teaches on tithing, so uh, I, I believe in tithing. I practice tithing. I believe in it. I think it's right. I think you should tithe. But I don't know who counts the checks here. You ever get these checks that say $413.17? It's up with that. I'll tell you what's up with that. They took their paycheck and a calculator and multiplied point times point one. Here's $413.17. Here's your tithe, God, and not one penny more. Come on, round it up. <laughs> but it's even beyond that. I'm talking about the life of spontaneous grace. To, to not live in the legalism, shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone. This year, I'll be a right-thinking Christian if it kills me. <laughs> the only thing is what? It'll kill you. That's the most joyless, passionless, empty, cold-hearted brand of Christianity imaginable. What God, God is a God of exceedingly, abundantly. 
We are also called to be Christians of exceedingly abundantly, to release and let go. I uh, was preaching in a revival service at a huge Methodist church in Georgia one time, and a lady came forward and she said, I want to I want to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, but there's something between me and God. I happen to be staying at this lady and her husband's house during this preaching series. They were, it was a huge house, beautiful, luxurious. And so I said, what is it? She said, you've seen it. What's standing between me and God? My house is decorated, the whole house, in antiques. She said, hundreds of thousands of dollars of antiques. She said, I'm terrified that if I really surrender my life to God, he'll make me give away my antiques. <laughs> she said, can you promise me that God won't ask for my antiques? I said, no. No, he may ask for them right here at the altar. But I said, all I know is you give everything to God and he'll give everything to you. Release. Well, she did. I was so proud of her. She just broke. She said, all right, God, it's all yours, everything. Her husband came up and said, I'm, I'm going to go on. You bring Dr. Rutland with you in the car. I've got to go home. He said, it's starting to snow, and I, I want to go home and take care of the dog. She said, get a blanket out of the house and wrap the dog up and put him in the garage. So later on, after we finished at the church, I rode back with her. When we drove up in the driveway, the lights hit the open garage. She stopped the car and burst out laughing. And I said, what's so funny? She said, the dog, the dog. I said, I, I can see the dog. What's funny? She said, I sent my husband home to put a blanket on the dog. She said, that idiot has wrapped him up in a $5,000 antique quilt. <laughs> I said, well, it's probably not too dirty by this time. Go and get it. She said, no, nope. no, I gave it to God at the altar. If he wants to give it to the dog, it's up to him. There, there has to be that spontaneity in our relationship with God and things and people. We, when we cut ourselves off from the flow of grace usward and from us and through us toward others, we, can I coin this phrase? We disgrace ourselves. We become disgraceful Christians Grace pools in us because we want the grace of God, but it doesn't flow out from us. And I'm not just talking money now. This is not a fundraising speech. I'm talking about the life of spontaneous grace. There are people around us that long for the grace of God to flow through us. Families, churches, there are disgraceful churches. I, uh, I finished preaching one Sunday at my church years ago and I went out to the lobby and the man came up to me. He was so angry he could hardly talk. And he, he said, well, I'm leaving the church. I said, why? He said, because of the lie that you told in the pulpit this morning. I said, what lie are you talking about? He said, I heard you. Nobody else may have heard you, but I heard you. He said, you talked about a certain battle that happened in World War I, and you said that battle happened in 1917. He said, I happen to be an expert on American military history, and I know that battle didn't happen until early 1918. He said, a man that a lie about a thing like that will lie about anything. And I can't attend a church where there's a liar in the pulpit. I said, well, bye. <laughs> no, I mean, adios, I cannot fix that for you. But let me tell you about another man in the same church, an attorney who was my friend, still my friend. We talk on the phone occasionally. And he came to me every Sunday, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, after every service, all the years I was there, he'd come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Rutland, it's the greatest sermon I've ever heard in my life. Now, listen, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. I know that you can't preach the definitive Christian masterpiece three times a week. I know that at a cognitive level, but I like that lawyer lying to me. <laughs> when I came out of the pulpit, I was looking for that attorney. I wanted a little grace. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, we can't do that with our pastor. We'll pump his ego. Go on and pump. There'll be some mean old lady in the lobby with a pen. She'll pop him. After a half a century in the ministry, I'm now convinced that the entirety of Christianity is divided into only two tribes, 
pumpers and poppers. I believe God's eyes move to and fro through the earth, looking for a church full of pumpers into which he can pour his grace and out through them into a needy community. The Lord has need of it is one thing. The world has need of it is another call for the release of grace. It's not just church, it's family. We pick and pry and nitpick at each other until we turn our own households into into graceless, cold, angry realities. I was the president at a large Christian university in the Midwest. One day a guy came to see me and got thousands of students. I didn't know them all, but this man told me his son's name. Of all the kids, I knew this kid. I said, oh, I know your son. What a wonderful boy. I said, he's on one of our worship teams. He's one of our campus chaplains. He said, yes, yes, I know all about that. That's not why I'm here. I said, well, why are you here? He said, it's that earring. He said, I want you to make him take that earring out. He said, I hate the sight of that earring. I wanted to say, look, you had him 18 years. I've had him three semesters. Why is this my job? (laughs) But you know, I felt in that moment that I discerned he was not ready for that moment of thinking. (laughs) The next day I called the boy in my office. I said, you know who was here yesterday? He said, oh yeah, I know. And he said, I know why he was here. He wants you to make me take this earring out. I said, yes, son, your dad is a piece of work. He said, oh, Dr. Rutland, he said, he's driving me crazy over this earring. Isn't that stupid? I said, it is stupid. He said, imagine letting an earring stand between you and somebody you love. That's so immature. I said, it's so immature. He said, just fighting over an earring. How stupid and selfish. I said, oh, stupid and selfish. He said, oh, I know what you're doing. I said, look, son, one of you is going to have to be an adult. And I met your dad. (laughs) I've never been so proud of a college boy in my life. He said, you know, I never thought about it from my point of view. I only was looking at it from his side. He said, you're right. He took that earring out of his ear, put it on my coffee table. And he said, my dad will never see that earring again as long as I live. Isn't that wonderful? Now look up here at me. I'm old. Boys wearing earrings. Am I the only one? I still struggle with it. You ever just want (laughs) Take that out of your ear and give it to your sister. (laughs) On the other hand, why do we make such big deals out of such stupid, insignificant things and disgrace our own families? We disgrace our children. We disgrace spouses. Guys, where are all the married men in the room? Raise your hand. Let me see where you are. I'm going to help you this morning. <laughs> when your wife walks out with that new dress on that she bought at the shopping mall, she's modeling it for you. She doesn't want you to peer over the top of the sports page. How much did that set me back? (laughs) I'm going to confiscate your credit card. She's modeling that dress for you. You throw the newspaper aside and jump to your feet and say, whoa. (laughs) Oh, baby. Oh, you look like a million bucks in that dress. You wear that on Wednesday night and we're going to be late to prayer meeting. Now that's grace. When I leave the house, travel, I'm travel and speak, headed off to some godforsaken foreign country, Michigan or something. And (laughs) my wife puts her little hands after 57 years of marriage, puts her little hands on my cheeks and she says, Mark, you are the handsomest, sexiest man that I've ever seen. Uh, Look look up here. (laughs) I live in the real world. But a lawyer and a wife who will both lie to you, that's grace. (laughs) That's not the worst of it, though. 
The worst of it is we don't just disgrace strangers and churches and pastors and family members. We disgrace ourselves. We live in a cloud of self-condemnation, not just over our sins, but over superficialities. We stare into the full-length mirror of self-evaluation and we despise what we see. We say, look at you. Where did your hair go? And whence cometh this fat? <laughs> we disgrace ourselves. Look, Pastor, I'm not trying to run your people off. But <laughs> <laughs> you understand this is not real Christianity. You understand that, right? Surely you do. This is church. I have never committed a really venal sin in church. This is not real. Real is a really cold Tuesday morning in January when you run out to get in your truck and you slam your hand in the door of your own truck. That's real. That's where you find out where the grace is operative in your life. You can say, oh, I'm getting a lawyer. Ford Motor Company's going down. Or you can blame God. Well, you've done it to me again. This is what I've come to expect. Or more likely, you disgrace yourself. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. <laughs> or you can lift that mangled paw aloft and say, Grace be unto thee. We disgrace ourselves. Look, if you have not yet raised up under a kitchen cabinet and knocked your brains loose, <laughs> it will happen. It will happen. Grace yourself. Grace yourself. There's no use. Pound the kitchen cabinet, scream at your wife, kick the dog. That's disgraceful. Or you can turn to your wife and say, laugh at me, baby. That was the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> well, I'm going to help you this morning. I'm going to free you up. Are you ready? I want you to turn to someone near you there, not your spouse. Turn to someone near you there, and I want you to say, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Doesn't that feel wonderful? <laughs> Free at last. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. Now I'm really going to shock you. Now I'm really going to shock you. Turn back to that same person and say, I already knew that. You see, you see all that wasted moral, spiritual, psychological, emotional energy trying to convince everybody else of your perfection and nobody was buying it from the very beginning. <laughs> We're in this together. We learn the grace of God to forgive us and heal us and cleanse us. And there's somebody near you that is saying the Lord has need of it. I have need of it. A spouse who longs for grace. A teenager who, despite his or her rebellions or wickedness or earrings, longs for grace. Teenagers. A parent who longs for grace to flow through you. You're not exempt from this. There are teenagers who condemn and judge their parents all the time. And their parents may be saying, oh, that my child might grace my life. The rude clerk at a shopping center, at a store, may, be, may not be as rude as you think she is. She may just be longing for somebody somewhere to give her the grace that she aches for. Graceless Christianity is not an alternative variety. It's an aberration. The spontaneous grace to give and give more than is asked, to give it without question. This guy, these people hot wire his truck. Start to drive off. He says, where are you going with my truck? And they lower the window and say, the Lord has need of it. 
And that's all he needs to hear. What manner of grace is that? That goes beyond, gives more, pours out the grace of affirmation onto the lives of those around us. I believe that that's the great message of Palm Sunday. Nobody played it close. They ripped the branches from the trees. They threw their garments in the road. They shouted Hosanna and they praised with a level of spontaneity that was, uh, spontaneity that was unguarded, a release, a flow of grace. Well, let me close with this. What if somebody came in here today that knew nothing, absolutely nothing about Christianity? And they said, how could I in one week understand Christianity? We gave them a Bible and said, take this and read it. And they begin to read. They start at Genesis and begin to read. And on into the New Testament, they read the whole Bible in a week. Faith begins to build in them. They begin to see the story of Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the epistles. They begin to read. What if they came through the whole thing and they came to the last verse in the Bible? What if the, the last thing anybody says to you is important? What if the last verse in the Bible says, I'm joking. I hate all of you. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Am I the only one? Wouldn't that be a little discouraging? Well, what if it says, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to let some of you come to heaven, some of you go to hell, but I'm not going to tell you how I choose. That's terrifying. You know how the Bible ends? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All the time, all the way, no matter what. It's as if God says, I've said this from the beginning of the book of Genesis, and you still won't hear me. Now I'm going to say it one more time. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. What words, what expression of our hearts, what could we say? Thank you. Thank you, God. Hosanna. We say it with the people by the roadside. Hosanna to the Lord. We praise you. Thank you for grace usward. Now, O oh Lord, remove every barrier from our lives that those who need grace from us may receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and God bless this great church. All right, folks, uh, I'm going to give Dr. Rutland a chance to get out to the atrium. Again, his books, the proceeds all go to these girls' homes to rescue them from sex trafficking in Ghana and in Thailand. So, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Bless Dr. Rutland and his ministry. Thank you, Lord, for your word today on this Palm Sunday. Bring us back together next weekend as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this Wednesday night as we remember the Passover service, and we just give you praise and thanks together in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen. Have a great day, folks. God bless you all.
once assured me Even in my doubt you gave your hand In the middle of the night you went before me You're here with me You are on my strength, you are my I'm singing from the faithfulness you've shown me There's nothing in my future I could fear My worship is a garment that has clothed me into the waves you turn stormy waters into firm foundations so i'll stand on
not the destination Cause I'm caught up in desperation here again I don't know who I am if I'm only trying to make it And I know that I gotta face it in the end Can't find myself unless you're next to me, yeah, next to me, yeah Feelings I felt won't get the best of me, yeah, best of me, yeah I need way more of you and less of me, yeah, less of me, yeah Yes to me in your name, peace. 